Loving God, would you unlock your words? Would you unlock our hearts? May you limit my words to your message. May we be transformed to love and trust you evermore. In Jesus' name, amen. The Coming up, there we go. God's story has always, always, always been an invitation to intimacy. Always. Today's the third of four of a series called Giving is Worship. Giving of our whole selves to God as an act of worship. The, the, sure, there's a financial application, and Eric got into that last week. But that's a mere byproduct and reflection of our spiritual temperature. Today's words, an oracle, comes straight from Scripture, and its entire message is that invitation to trust. The Sistine Chapel. We find God giving life, imparting himself into the limp, fingers of the lifeless Adam. The word that God uses is his breath. The word for spirit, giving life into Adam. It reflects and tries to hold what the scriptures tell us from Genesis 1. And then God said, let us make people in our image, in our likeness, the Trinity Somehow the creation without people was incomplete. He continues, so God created mankind, people in his own image. In his image, he created them, male and female. Creating us this relational context to be a people together with him forever. This invitation of Adam is our invitation. But also shared with Adam is our story of the break in trust of God. Because we all know how Eden ends. A fracture of relationship, of living in dependent intimacy with God as they groped for a control to live independent. They knew it the second they were. They knew the change in the relationship and the trust and the intimacy and the dependency was gone. I tell you that because there is nothing made special, like this was the first time the Lord ever walked in the garden in the cool of the day, that this was an ordinary act. But as soon as God walked face to face with them, they hid because they knew the relationship had been fractured. It's not unique to Adam and Eve and all of the people who began our story, but it follows through consistently that we as a people strive to break the relationship and leave a place of in, of dependence to independence, of intimacy to self-control. The early church patriarchs, one after another after another. The judges... The kings, the leading into captivity, this cycle of sin, break away, repent, return of fellowship, independent cycle, dysfunctional again, break away from God, continues through. It's exercised in the biographies of Jesus, the four gospels. We see it again and again and again. Jesus is face to face invitation to people to enter into that trust. We see it from the very birth of the church. We can gain some comfort by seeing their dysfunction. You read the letters of the New Testament and you go, it's the very same rubbish we face as the church today. Nothing has changed. It's followed through the history of the church. Lord knows the history records our stains so clearly. All the way to today and even our story as a church here When trust is broken, the disappointment is so deep 
That disappointment is a word that can't fill that hurt and that grief and that anger and that fracture of relationship. And it's hard to ever trust or dare to trust or think that we could trust or could return. I listened to this book, Malachi, probably 15 times in the past week on audio. I read it, the whole thing, start to finish again this morning. There's something when you read it that has been programmed into us from years of hearing God's word that somehow in the late 20th century, in the early 21st century, when we read these words, we often read them with anger. I listened to the audio narration of the scripture and he read the scripture with anger. This righteous indignation. And somehow misses the invitation of God laced through this entire letter. Begging, pleading to restore the relationship back to dependence and intimacy. That's often the case with the prophets. They're often divorced from their context. You read some Habakkuk. You read a Malachi or an Amos. And they're just read and all the prophets are kind of kept over here and there's a group of books together. And they say really strange things that have an immediate application but this foreshadowing, echoing, repeated implication through to the great day of the Lord. But we don't know how they fit in. We don't sit there and look that Isaiah spoke in the last 20 years of Israel before it's carried into captivity. We don't take Jeremiah and overlay it that he sat on the Mount of Olives with Jerusalem smoking, the bodies bloated as they decay in the sun, in the heat, in the heaving grief with which he wrote Lamentations. We lose the context and they're spooky so we stay away. Into Malachi. Malachi is the last prophet, the last recorded words, an oracle, the reader said. The last recorded truth and word from God before God went silent for 400 years. He no longer spoke to people as a whole or individually For 400 years, he went silent. It's 500 years, 500 years after they were carried into captivity. It's 100 years after Ezra and Nehemiah bring back the remnants to rebuild Jerusalem. Ezra and Nehemiah kindled this heart and this fire and this remnant of people, maybe 10% of the Jews in Babylon left and came home. The Jews who had been scattered through imperial redistribution of people groups so they can't rebel. Those Jews didn't come back. People, pagans, have been who worship and have lives in, of, of worshiping gods of stone and wood and abhorrent Worship and lifestyle practices are occupying their land. They're still under colonial rule. They are living at subsistence with any wealth and produce of the country taken away by empire. There's no hope. Ezra and Nehemiah miraculously lead this people to fix the broken down walls, put new gates on their hinges to the gates to the city, and even rebuild the temple. But it was only 70 years after being taken into captivity. So the elderly who came back, as everybody celebrated, rightly so, that the walls and the gates and a new temple are built, this new temple is this redacted shell of what it used to be. And when they offered their praise and worship, the Spirit did not show up as He had in the past, in history, to not just fill and be present in the first temple or as he had done in the tabernacle tent when they were a mobile people. And when these elderly people saw this worship going on, the scripture tells us they wept and sobbed in tears because it was just a hut compared to the temple that had been. It's now decades later, Ezra and Nehemiah have left, a hundred years have passed, none of those people who came back are alive. It's these new people who are living there, still in this dejected, sad state. And they've lost even a concept 
of intimacy and God moving amongst them in a trust of God in that time. This context is where we find Malachi writing. These last words from our God. Oop, went the wrong way. There we go. I want you to think of Malachi, even though there are harsh words, I want you to not miss the invitation that he brings us. They are a powerful pleading of God, the heart and emotion of our God to call us back. But yet the letter reveals this cycle of inability to trust, inability to follow. The writer of the Proverbs tells us, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, a lot of times we try to look at that very concretely, that they'll just all be killed when there's no vision. But there's something about a people without a hope and a vision. Anybody watching the international news of what's going on in the States? There's no vision. There's no hope. They're consumed by distrust and eternal strife. The president wages war with his own people. Where there is no vision, the people perish. This is where these people were. Nowhere to go and no hope. So the passages that were given us, it opens up a prophecy, the oracle of Yahweh to Israel through Malachi. God's first words, I have kessed you. I have completely, unconditionally, covenantially, no possibility of ever stopping, loved you. But from their brokenness, they say to God, how have you loved us? And he reminds them of Esau and Jacob. Jacob betrays his birthright. I mean, Esau betrays his birthright. Jacob is the one through which God blesses and loves and calls them to be a hope to a world who does not know him. You get to verse 6, and he does the son and father, the master and slave context of respect and love, and he begins an indictment of the priests. Have you, and he says, he quotes him and says, but you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? And it talks about this defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you? And they're bringing these blind animals for sacrifice. Now, this immediately revealed there was a, a way of worshiping God with their first fruits. It wasn't a monetary society. It was a harvest and, and, and the animal, the, the sheep, their herd society. And they were to bring their very first fruits. We, we all know we're in a fruited plain. The first fruit of a season is always the best. The fruit at the end, not quite the same. They were bringing that fruit. They weren't bringing the sheep without blemish. Those are worth a lot of money. They were bringing the lame and the diseased. They're not worth very much. You see, it wasn't God being arrogant about the fact of this is a blemish lamb and this one isn't. This is the first fruit. This is the last. It was about you won't trust me. You won't live in dependency and relationship with me for me to provide for you and care for you and bless you. And the spiritual leaders were allowing it. The leadership were failing to be the guardians, the stewards of who God's people were to be. When I sit there before I stand here, there's this urge inside of me that wants to run out and run home and put on my sweats and pull up my hood. 
because I'm not perfect by any means. Get close enough to me, the cracks show. Just ask my family. Ask my friends. You know what a tic-tac is? Little, you always have two or three when one would do fine. You know the little books, Our Daily Bread and the like, they give you little short comforting messages. They're not bad. I get stuff that pops up on my screen every day that I've subscribed to to give me some little encouragement for the day, some little thing I haven't, hmm, hadn't thought about that, that's nice. But I want to rend my clothes when leaders of God's church, they only feed their people Tic Tacs. They only say things that leaves them, nice sermon today, vicar. We can go home feeling good about ourselves. And I just want to rip my clothes because they're not, they never take their people from milk to meat. They never call their people from self-control and self-independency, the very sin of Eden and the whole story of God's people to today. They never call them back to intimacy and dependency with God. He goes on. I love this. You'll see there, I will curse you and I'll curse your blessings. And then you get to verse 3. I'll rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your offerings. The Hebrew word is really hard, prius. Can you say that, prius? All right, here's the meaning of prius. Dung, crap. This is the living God speaking out of emotion. This isn't doctrine. This is God's heart. I will take your blemished, diseased animal's dung, and I will smear it on your face, and you'll be carried out the same way their dung is carried out. It breaks God's heart that his people, his leaders, who were to preserve knowledge because they're the messengers of Yahweh, to give instruction to call God's people back to the right relationship with him. Chapter 2. All boats rise and fall on the tide. In the 20th century, we developed this idea that following Jesus was some independent individual idea. We've moved further and further in our affluence and our ability to put people on the moon and do great things. And we refuse to move to a place of dependence, just like all our ancestors did. Now, something happens when you get to verse 13. He uses some really interesting language. The wife of your youth, you fled the, the altar with tears, and you weep in way because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. And you ask why. These people knew they weren't depending on God. They knew that they were going through all the motions of worship. They were going through all the religion. They didn't think God listened or cared, so why give him the the best? Give him the last fruits. Give him the blemished lamb, because he doesn't care. The trust was so broken. Those of you who are married or have been married, widowed, etc., Understand that in a marriage, which is the language. Now look, let me tell you this. They were intermarrying. It's how we ended up with these people in the New Testament referred to as Samaritans. The Hebrew people marrying these Gentiles who worship gods of stone and sacrifice their children as worships to these lifeless gods. So yes, they're addressing that. But you miss the shadow of what's being said if you take it so lightly. God is calling us back to an image that we can understand of interdependence that takes place in a marriage. This interdependence that you need each other and each of you do something that the other can or cannot do. It's as simple as I am horrible with names. You would think with what I do, I would be gifted. This is my thorn in my side. I've asked the Lord to take away seven times and he will not. I'm horrible at it. Enter Suzanne. 
who can tell you what I wore on the second day. We had seen each other ever, and the relationship was brand new. She goes, that's Jamie. You know him from here. Ask about this. Got it. Hi, Jamie. It's great to see you. How is? She's also the financial person. That's her world. Our church has this disproportionate number of accountants and finance people. You're going to appreciate this. When we first got married, literally three ring binder briefings on our finances. And some of the numbers were in parentheses, and some of them had negatives in front of them, but that was good, not bad, which totally was just, I couldn't understand it. Honey, pictures, pie charts. So she would come with a front back sheet, pie charts, (laughs) right, speaking my language. Red, nice. All these decades later, the level of trust for her to handle that, dependence upon her to handle that, has proven itself. And even when she's doing something that I don't understand, and all of my independence and insecurity to live in interdependence screams, take control, take control, take control. I don't understand, but I know her. And I live in interdependence with her and let her manage that. All these years later, the savings for our sons to do their tertiary training has been in place for a long time and grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. Because I let her do that because I couldn't. We would live in a pup tent if you let me manage the money. I don't walk into the preservatory, present my little card, wave it, and fear it going decline. I know that I'm going to have my coffee because she manages that. There's something about the language that God uses about relationship and marriage to give us the understanding of interdependence and intimacy that we're supposed to understand about God. And it's repeated in the theme and the thread of Scripture from beginning to end. And it's language that God uses here. Calling us back to that level of dependence. Verse 6 was not in the reading. But it's important. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Right back to his word at the beginning. I have kessed you unconditionally, everlasting, faithfully loved you. I've made this covenant with you. And even though we've had all of this broken relationship, I still stand in that covenant and I invite you back. This isn't God being angry. This is God pleading for this relationship But he reminds them, ever since your ancestors have turned away, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? So they ask, how can they return to that intimate relationship? And he tells them, enter back into a place where you have to give sacrificially and watch. Watch what I do. Watch how I fill the storehouse. Watch how I open heaven and pour out. Why should I trust Suzanne with the money? Because the storehouse becomes full and flows out. God's inviting us back to a place of dependency and independency. Now you have to understand, we are rebellious. We will naturally, every time, even if we move to a place of interdependency and trusting and loving God and giving him our best, which could cost us. And we get afraid that he's not going to take care of us and we run and grope for independence and self-control again and again and again. But he's calling back and saying, just trust me. This isn't in your reading, but this is the crux. 
Then those who feared Yahweh talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Then those who feared Yahweh, those who respected and took him serious, got together and recommitted themselves, wrote it down so they could be held accountable for it, and stepped into dependence again. Not everybody did. The history proves that, written out about Israel, but some did. And in the presence of God, they made it public and they made the statement and they did it. On the day when I act, says Yahweh Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. Verse 18, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Because God will be faithful. This is the call of everything in scripture. To return us to Eden. This is the new heaven and the new earth. A return to that type of intimacy and dependence upon and blessing and fulfillment and protection. This was the invitation in the garden. This was what it was supposed to be like. But through history, we've broken it. But God can put it back together again and even with the scars showing be more beautiful than ever before. This is the hope. But here's something we talked about yesterday that came up as a side note in the discussion of the leadership lab yesterday. Repeating this Saturday. I'll be there at three. See you. Is that the more broken and dysfunctional we get, The more broken individuals, the more broken families, the more broken societies. The harder it is to imagine, much less move the distance to health and trust again. The kid who's been massively abused can't imagine a loving father. It's too hard. It's too scary. The risk is too big. The worse the dysfunction, the further they are. The jump is just too scary. I don't care who wins the election. Well, I do care who wins the election in November, I'll be honest. I care a lot. The whole world cares a lot. But if there's a change in the presidency, it will not take these people from here. And return them to here. And that's going to be the big disappointment. Is that it is so broken and hurt and dysfunctional and acrimonious and vitriol and nasty. That the road to here is so far. This is the story of the church. This is our story. So I want to leave you with a little bit of humor and laughing. And my props that are an invitation To hope. You know where that is? Victoria Falls, right? They strung a big wire across Victoria Falls, and there was a man who gathered a crowd. And he got them all and said, we're going to do something amazing today. You're going to see me do something absolutely amazing. I'm going to walk across that wire and not fall. Now, Victoria Falls, the sound is deafening. So he's up close to them. And he takes off across the wire. And he walks. And he does it so carefully. And he gets the other side. And the people are beginning to clap. Because that's pretty amazing. And they're celebrating. And he turns to him and he goes, Do you think I could do it without a pole? Yeah, we believe you can. We love to see somebody fall, don't we? (laughs) X Games, you know, great surfer, wipe out. Yeah. So he walks without the pole and he makes it to the other side and they clap and they cheer. And he says, you think I could do it with a bicycle? Oh, this is going to be good when he wipes out. (laughs) We love, we love other people's failure, right? So he gets on the bike and he rides it across 
And there's a couple times when he almost loses it. And he steadies it and he does the back and forward pedaling and he holds it and he gets to the other side and they all clap and he immediately turns around and he does it and he comes back at twice the speed that he went over. And he makes it to the other side. Well, now their confidence and their excitement in this guy is getting pretty big. And what seems like a step backwards, he goes, do you think I could do it with a wheelbarrow? Oh, yeah, sure, that was easy. You did the bicycle, you'll do the wheelbarrow. So he gets the wheelbarrow and he brings it out and he, he's ready to start and he pauses. And he goes and he gets some bricks. And he loads it in. Anybody ever push a wheelbarrow with too much weight on it? Everybody ever have the wheelbarrow? Yeah. And so he fills it and, and he walks with this wheelbarrow over and there's a couple times and everybody gasps and the place goes quiet and they saw it and, and they think because the wheelbarrow falls, his balance the way he is, he'll fall too. And now they want him to succeed and he's doing this and he's carrying, he gets to the other side with this wheelbarrow with these bricks on the side and they're just going bananas. And he dumps the bricks out. And from under a tarpaulin, he brings out a mannequin that's the weight of a human being. And he puts it in there. Do you think I can walk across this gorge with this mannequin in here? And they say, oh yeah, you could do it, you could do it. It's great, it's fantastic. And he walks across the gorge with the mannequin in it. And now he's back on their side. And he dumps the mannequin out. And he gets them frothing with excitement. Do you think I could do this with a human being? Oh yeah, you could do it. Could, do you really believe I could do it with a human being in a wheelbarrow? Yes, we believe. Do you really believe? Yes, we believe. Do you believe I could Really, do you believe I could do it with a human being in there? I absolutely believe you can. I've watched you do all this stuff. Get in. <laughs> the invitation to trust inherently comes, inher- is, in trust is inherent vulnerability. In trust is inherent risk. In trust is inherent hurt and disappointment. In trust and intimacy is, it's scary. From Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. In this oracle, very few times does the word oracle, the powerful truth of God, get used in Scripture. The very oracle, the very words and truth of God given to us through this prophet. A massive invitation to love, to dependence, to risk, and the promise of great things and great blessing. Loving God, may we be a people who dare, who dare to trust. May we be a people who dare to risk. May we be a people, though we have had hurt, personally, family, professionally, though there has been wounding and every reason in the world's mind to not trust you, may we trust you again. As a church with our offerings, our first fruits, our unblemished lambs, May we step forward to trust you again. Loving God, we know you have the cattle on a thousand hills. We know this. You need nothing from us, but you invite us into this. And to be honest, it's scary. But we worship you and we thank you and we celebrate you. And we anticipate the day when we see you face to face. And we no longer have to trust in a hope. But loving God, we pray in our weakness as human beings that you will fulfill the words from Malachi, that you will fill the storehouses to overflowing, that our fruit will not drop too early, that pests will not destroy it, that you are on our side that we are loved with a kessid love. May we be these people. In Jesus' name, amen. She going to pray up here? There you are.